Hello, Crime Style listeners. We're thrilled to have you with us. I'm Ashley. And I'm Ricky. And this week, we'll be covering a very recent case. This story will take us to Rochester, Minnesota, where we'll focus on the death of 32-year-old Mayo Clinic pharmacist, Betty Bowman. Betty Bowman, 32 years old, and her husband, Connor, 30 years old, looked like they had an idyllic life. They met at the University of Kansas School of Pharmacy, and after graduation, she became an operating room pharmacist, and he started medical school, moonlighting as a poison control specialist. The couple did not shy away from the fact that they had an open relationship. They agreed to see other people on the condition that they were always open with each other about any partners. Everything seemed perfect until August 16th, when Betty goes to the emergency room in Rochester, Minnesota, with a severe case of food poisoning. Over the next four days, her condition worsens with no explanation when Betty dies of organ failure. After Connor tries to cancel the autopsy and expedite Betty's cremation, her grieving friends sound the alarm. Is Connor Bowman trying to cover something up? Now, just to note here, although Connor Bowman has been arrested and is charged with homicide, the trial has not occurred, and therefore there is a presumption of innocence. So just a reminder that this is an active investigation, and no verdict has been rendered. And additionally, most of the witnesses are not identified by name. Articles use a friend, a companion, or a family member whereas court documents identify witnesses using only their initials. But this also means that we have an opportunity for a side salad mini-sode. Ooh. So that's cool. And also, there is an active GoFundMe being run by Betty's family to cover the cost of her mom, Nancy, traveling to and from Kansas in Minnesota for anything related to the death investigation or Connor's trial. And we'll put that link in our description. So as we were saying, 32-year-old Mayo Clinic pharmacist Betty Bowman was an incredibly healthy and active woman until August 16th, 2023, when overnight she became critically ill with what seemed like no warning. Betty worked as a pharmacist while her husband Connor completed his internal medicine residency. At first glance, they seemed perfectly matched but behind closed doors, the few short years they had been married had been fraught with dishonesty and hidden debts. Yeah, lying and money never really goes well together. Betty Sponsel, which was her maiden name, was born in Wichita, Kansas on December 13th, 1990. She was adventurous and loved traveling. Her social media was filled with travel photos, hiking and spending time outdoors in Yosemite, Hawaii, Chicago, New York, the Grand Canyon, and the Caribbean. Betty's younger sister, Brianna, wrote a memorial post on Facebook about how kind and caring she was, saying she loved all living things and even made sure to leave spiders in the house and not kill them because she knew that they were there to help. And sometimes she even gave the spiders names. A friend from school commented, Once in undergrad, there was a massive spider on the inside of my windshield, and I was too scared to squish it. So I called Betty because I knew she wasn't afraid of spiders. I can't remember if she squished it or if she saved it, but she certainly came to help me. Now, Betty and Connor met at the University of Kansas, where they both were enrolled in pharmacy school. He was slightly younger, born on March 21st, 1993, and classmates say they hit it off right away. Betty graduated from the University of Kansas School of Pharmacy with a pharmaceutical doctorate in 2017 and completed her residency at Stormont Vale Hospital in Topeka, Kansas in 2018. Now, after their graduation, Betty started working right away as a pharmacist. 
But Connor continued at the University of Kansas, getting his medical degree and working for the university as a poison control specialist. Interesting. Now, together they became proud dog parents to an adorable corgi named Sir Crumpet II of Mulberry. Aww. So cute. And Betty loved spoiling Crumpet with doggy treats, toys, and outings to local parks. And they even ran an Instagram account for Crumpet, who became a bit of a local internet celebrity. Which I had a hard time finding if that page was still active. Now, on Connor's match day, the day he found out where he would match to do his medical residency, Betty had an adorable custom corgi doctor cake made. When Connor matched at Mayo Clinic Rochester for his residency in internal medicine, the couple moved from Kansas to Rochester, Minnesota, where Betty also started working for Mayo Clinic as an operating room pharmacist. Seems like a really normal couple, right? Like, very high-achieving. Yeah, goal-oriented. Like, they definitely, uh, yeah, they they were busy, working hard. Yeah, and they were raising this cute, adorable dog who was internet famous. Now, as we mentioned, the open relationship thing that they had going on, it was pretty common knowledge to their friends, their family, and their classmates that this was all going on. Even after they got married in May of 2021, they agreed to see other people on the condition that they were always open with each other about any partners. This agreement seemed to be working for them both. They both seemed to be happy, and they were clearly finding lots of success professionally. No one really suspected that they were having any issues until April of 2023. When Betty traveled home to Wichita, Kansas to visit her family, and Connor stayed behind to work. Betty had returned home to help her mother leave her difficult marriage with Betty's father. And while home, she coordinated packing, signing papers, and organized the finances that would allow her mom the freedom to find somewhere to live and support herself for a short time while she got back on her feet. And while at home, Betty told her sister that she knew Connor wasn't being honest about his partners, and that based on the condition in their marriage to be upfront with one another, in order for an open relationship to work, she felt that he was being unfaithful. But why the dishonesty, you know? Yeah, it makes you wonder. I First thing off the top of my head, though, I mean, maybe he met someone he felt more serious about. Or the fact that maybe he had to communicate to these women or his partners, whatever, that he was in an open relationship. You know, maybe he didn't want to admit those things. True. Now, on top of all of that and the secretive relationships that were happening, you know, in the background, Betty discovered Connor was hiding a large amount of debt from her after seeing some bills and final notices arriving in the mail. Now. They both had doctorate degrees, and Connor was in medical school, so there obviously was some student debt that would have been expected. But this debt was a complete surprise to Betty. Betty's family encouraged her to take the advice that she gave her mom and to think about leaving as well. Well, Obviously, this debt has to be something not typical, right? Something that they didn't communicate, which also could be secret. Like, I'm kind of thinking, could it have been credit card debt? Like, he's taking these other women out to restaurants and things like that, like racking up this credit card debt secretly and, you know, planning these trips and things like that while they're married. That's kind of what I was thinking, secret trips. Maybe he bought someone a car. I don't know. You know, maybe he's paying for a secret apartment, something like that. Or not an apartment, but maybe like he bought a secret condo. Things that are just like over the top that would really cause for concern because obviously her family was like, maybe you should think about divorcing him. Right. Now, it wasn't just Betty's family who was concerned about her. Many of their friends knew about the difficulties in Betty and Connor's marriage. 
And those friends also urged her to think about divorce, but she wasn't ready. Betty really wanted to try to work things out. Just a few months later, it seemed like maybe the tide was turning, and after eight years together and two years married, Betty finally started contemplating divorce. Connor had started seeing other women, almost exclusively, even inviting them to stay over in their home. And although Betty knew about this other woman, Connor would often still lie about where he was, telling Betty that he was at work when he was out on a date. Betty was also dating two people at the time, so the issue wasn't other relationships. It was the constant lying and the, you know, secret keeping, which was becoming more and more of a problem. Yeah, I mean, they they agreed on communication. Like, this obviously isn't fun anymore. Yeah, there's no communication. So on August 14th, 2023, Betty texted one of her partners. And in the criminal complaint documents, he is identified by his initials, SS. And she told SS that she had a few days off work and was looking forward to spending some time with him. They saw each other the next day, and they texted with each other later that night. Betty told SS that she and Connor were spending a quiet night, having some drinks, and made plans to see each other again in the upcoming days. Now, the next morning, Betty messaged SS, canceling their plans, stating that she was really sick and could not sleep at all because of how ill she's been. She thought maybe it was a drink that Connor had made her because it had been mixed in a large smoothie. Now, Betty seemed to get worse and pretty quickly decided it was time to head to the hospital. Connor called Betty's family to let them know that they were in the emergency room because Betty was having some stomach issues and was dehydrated, but he assured them it wasn't anything to worry about, and he'd keep them posted about what was going on. The hospital thought Betty had a pretty classic, although really severe, case of food poisoning and started treatment for that, but Betty didn't respond and instead deteriorated very quickly. Only a few hours later, Connor called Betty's family a second time to tell them that she was being moved to intensive care. Betty's mom and sister couldn't find a flight out right away, so instead they drove overnight. They made the nine-hour trip from Wichita to Rochester with barely any stops. And when they arrived the next morning, it was clear Betty was very sick. Betty's mom, Nancy, said in a recent interview, she was very weak, but she could talk. She had no energy, couldn't even get a drink by herself. Now, after hearing about how bad things were looking, Betty's dad, David, who had stayed behind in Wichita, called Connor to ask for an update. And Connor told him she's about 80% gone. 80% gone. Right. Isn't that a strange way to describe the situation to yeah. her dad? Well, it's definitely like a heartless way. She's about 80% gone. But at the same time, it's probably doctor's talk. Why would a doctor say that to the family, though? Not to mention, well, he has ties to the family. So that's what makes it even more strange, right? Like, I think a doctor to an unrelated family tries to be professional and he may say something analytical like that or maybe he's just got doctor brain similar True. to like working with engineers yeah a lot of times when you're working with engineers they say some like really weird stuff that has nothing to do with emotion yeah good but point. in this situation that's family you know he knows these people like this is his wife that is just a weird way to phrase that it's like a detached way of talking about it. Mm, this is the person that he married. It just seems very insensitive. Yeah, definitely. Now, during this time, there were about two dozen of Betty's friends, coworkers, and former classmates who came to visit, taking turns rotating into the room to visit. Betty's condition continued to worsen, and on the third day at the hospital, she lost consciousness. Now, Connor was 
insistent that Betty had a rare illness called hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. Hopefully I didn't butcher it too bad. It was pretty close. Or HLH for short. Just don't cancel us. We're not doctors. Obviously. Now, HLH is an illness where white blood cells build up in organs, causing internal damage. HLH is considered a rare disease that is almost always diagnosed in childhood. And while it can occur at any age, it is incredibly rare to see in adulthood. To be honest, it sounds like one of the illnesses on House, like Dr. House. Now, Betty's family, they had never heard of this illness before, but they trusted Connor. He loved their daughter, and after all, he was a doctor. Like most of us would, they Googled HLH, and the explanation did seem to fit since Betty's organs were failing. But behind the scenes, doctors were running tests, and the results weren't showing any evidence of HLH. Without a positive result, doctors couldn't say conclusively what was causing Betty's illness, which also meant they couldn't treat her. They could only scramble to deal with the new symptoms as they appeared. Betty had been experiencing severe diarrhea and nausea when she was admitted to the hospital. Then she developed fluid in her lungs, followed by heart and kidney failure. She was taken for an emergency surgery to remove part of her colon, but the staff was unable to determine the cause of symptoms. Unfortunately, after four days in the hospital on August 20th, 2023, Betty died. Even though she'd been so ill, everyone was in shock. And Connor, he wrote Betty's obituary and included HLH as Betty's official cause of death, which how could you? Betty was only 32 years old. She had been so healthy and lively, and suddenly she was gone. What's strange about that, though, is Connor wrote that she had HLH, but the other doctors weren't able to find anything that showed that she had that. Like there's nothing documented that Betty even had the sickness or the illness, whatever. And then to just write it on her... Obituary? Yeah. Like you would have to be raising some red flags here, especially for the family. Also, they were saying, you know, food poisoning or whatever when she first came to the hospital. But she had mentioned that, you know, the smoothie, she thought it might have been the smoothie. So... Did the family know about that or the doctors? Like, was that even a consideration? I feel like she could have had a suspicion. And also everything that was going on in the relationship might have been adding up. But yeah, it seemed like everyone who spoke about her spoke about how healthy and active she was. So it's really unexpected to see someone so young, 32 years old. Like, Yeah, that's a shock. Like that would literally rock a neighborhood, a community, the family. Yeah, she had no health issues at all that were obvious, no symptoms or anything that her family knew about. Like, did she secretly have HLH that no one knew but Connor? Yeah, but is it like some bedroom diagnosis, you know? Is this something he observed from home and just noted it in his mind? Well, technically he's a doctor, and that's why the family kind of trusted him. Yeah, I guess so. You wouldn't think that he would have bad intentions. Now, when someone so young dies, there is almost always an autopsy, especially in a case like Betty's where there's such severe symptoms that appear so quickly and all of these tests are taken and they're failing to uncover what caused her death. But Connor requested that the autopsy should be skipped and that Betty should be cremated immediately because it's what Betty would have wanted. Hmm. Get rid of the evidence. Exactly. Connor sent this request to the medical examiner's office by email and additionally asked the investigators with the medical examiner's office if a postmortem toxology report would be more thorough than the ones done at the hospital while Betty was ill. He even asked for a list 
of what was specifically going to be tested for. That has to be suspicious. Oh, yeah. Because on August 21st, 2023, one day after Betty's death, Southeast Minnesota Medical Examiner's Office halted Betty's cremation and alerted the police that they believed her death to be suspicious. Dang, that was close. In addition to the bizarre circumstances and Connor's strange behavior, the medical examiner's office also received a complaint from a mutual friend of the couple, only recorded in documents as CGK. She informed the medical examiner that Betty and Connor had been having issues and were talking about divorce due to infidelity and financial issues. That nasty cocktail. Yeah. Exactly. And that was enough for the Rochester police to begin a more thorough investigation. And they started interviewing friends and co-workers of both Betty and Connor. On August 10th, less than a week before Betty's mysterious illness, a friend was visiting Betty and Connor at their home. Connor made Betty a smoothie, which was surprising because it wasn't something he would typically do. When Betty took a sip of her drink, she thought it tasted strange and asked her friend what she thought. The friend tried the drink and agreed that it tasted really bitter and jokingly said, Connor must be trying to poison you. They laughed about it and Betty agreed that it was a possibility and poured the rest of the smoothie out without drinking it. So she didn't even drink it after that. Right. Now, at the time, it seemed like a harmless, funny moment between friends, but now that Betty had died so suddenly, the whole interaction seemed a lot more suspicious. More suspicious is an understatement. Honestly, that's about as suspicious as taking out life insurance on your spouse right before they die. Well, funny you should say that. Another friend told investigators that Connor had told her he was going to get $500,000 from life insurance when Betty died. Oh, my. Okay, so we have infidelity, we have the financial issues, and now we have a $500,000 payout from life insurance? Right. And we already knew that, Connor, he was carrying some pretty large debt, so that $500,000 would help out tremendously, and he can continue with his life you know, doing his thing. Yeah, clean slate. Now, when detectives searched the house, they did find a receipt showing a $450,000 bank deposit, but it hasn't been verified if that was related to the insurance policy. The same friend also told police that three days after Betty had died, she went to the house to check in. Connor's girlfriend was there, and all of the photos of Betty had been removed. That's quick. Moving on quick. Detectives also learned that Connor Bowman had accessed his wife's electronic health record at the hospital using his medical credentials. On August 16th, when she was first admitted to the hospital, Betty did grant access to Connor to access her health information. From the day she arrived at the hospital until the day of her death, Connor checked Betty's electronic health record several times, which included admission information, reviewing notes, medications, allergies, and an operating room log. And while this may seem weird, it's technically not illegal since Betty had granted him permission. uh, That one kind of goes both ways because... You know, if you were to die and I had access to your medical records, I may review them and, you know, try to make sense of it or something like that. But I think with this pun intended toxic cocktail, everybody's already kind of suspicious. So I don't know. I guess it could go both ways on that. He's a doctor, so obviously he wants to be involved. He's checking her file. Maybe he's trying to come up with some type of conclusion. But at the same time, like, is he, you know, reviewing information, insider information, and then, like, planning ahead? Yeah, maybe he was worried about her during that time. He wanted to try to make sense of the whole thing since he had access to it. He had an understanding of it, being that he was a doctor. But 
all of that permission expires if or when the patient dies. And what's interesting is after Betty died, until August 23rd, Connor checked Betty's electronic health record every single day. On August 22nd, he even created a new entry. And although he didn't add any information to the file, since he created a new documentation, it meant he was then identified in the system as part of Betty's medical team, which meant he could enter her medical file at any time without entering his credentials. Oh, okay. So that's interesting. So it's kind of like he knew that, you know, little loophole. Mm -hmm. Connor was a resident at the hospital, but he also worked as a, as we mentioned before, poison specialist for the University of Kansas. He worked mostly remotely, where he answered calls for the 24-hour poison control hotline. He was given a laptop by the university that used a VPN authentication process, so he could essentially work from anywhere. But it also meant only someone using his credentials could log in to use those devices. Connor worked the remote poison control job on August 5th, 6th, and 10th. During those shifts, someone using Connor's laptop and credentials was researching colchicine, a medication used to treat gout. According to the criminal complaint, investigators looked into all of the phone calls that had come into the 24-hour poison control line, and Connor hadn't received any calls about colchicine, and none of the other employees working that night on the team had either. So there was no reason he should have been researching colchicine. Armed with this information, the medical examiner's office was able to run more specialized blood and urine tests. And can you guess what they showed? Colchicine. At a high enough level that it was determined Betty's cause of death due to toxic effects of colchicine and the manner of her death as listed as homicide. Didn't we also cover a case, I think it happened last year, it was like a Colorado couple, one of them was a dentist, and they used the same thing. Same thing, colchicine and also toxic smoothie. Toxic smoothie. Toxic cocktail. Seems like this is getting more and more common. It was also financial issues, too. Yes, yeah, similar case, very similar case, actually. Mm -hmm. So, colchicine is a medication that's pretty commonly prescribed for gout, which is an inflammatory type of arthritis that Betty was not diagnosed with. I didn't know that. It's also a medication that has something called a narrow therapeutic window, which means the dose they give to treat gout and the dose that can be lethal can be fairly close. <laughs> According to a study on colchicine poisoning, a typical prescription of colchicine is around 1.2 to 2.4 milligrams per day, and the lowest reported lethal dose of oral colchicine are 7 to 26 milligrams. Colchicine poisoning can be pretty horrific. It starts with extreme gastrointestinal symptoms, then complete organ failure. There's no antidote and no cure, so there's really nothing anyone can do other than treat symptoms and attempt to stabilize. But that's if medical professionals know there's colchicine poisoning. Right, and you can't find something that you're not looking for. Exactly. Now, it just so happens on August 10th, someone on the same device accessed a medical journal that is often used by medical professionals to search the lethality of substances. And on that same device, a calculator was used to convert 120 pounds, which was Betty's weight at the time of her death, into kilograms and multiplied it by 0 0.8, which is considered the lethal dosage for coltracine according to that same medical journal. Yeah, so some doctor, calculated individual, did this. On a laptop that was Connor's. Right, so. Interesting. So obviously someone with 
the credentials of Connors, who has a doctor brain, did this calculation, and go figure, it matches Betty. Hmm, very peculiar. Very. Now, just one day later, guess what Connor purchased? Drugs. Liquid colchicine from an online pharmacy called Mark Cuban Cost Plus Drugs. He used his Mayo Clinic email address to make the purchase before closing, then completely deleting the account altogether. Suspish. Records with the online pharmacy show when Connor deleted his account, he claimed Betty had fraudulently purchased colchicine under his name. Mm -hmm. He also allegedly told the company that he wanted to delete the purchase data associated with the account because his employer, Mayo Clinic, had confronted him for ordering and purchasing a prescription of Viagra for himself. So embarrassing. Law enforcement requested Connor's emails and disciplinary records from Mayo Clinic to verify the information from the online shop. But the result of that search warrant has not been made public. Yet. Now, before that, on August 5th, which was also one of Connor's scheduled shifts, someone using Connor's work device googled the phrases, Internet browsing history. Can it be used in court? Also, police track package delivery and delete Amazon data police. Hmm. I wonder if it was the Corgi. How long does dog food take to arrive? <laughs> okay, that one might have been the dog. The rest were Connor. And on top of all of those searches, Connor's Amazon purchase history shows on August 5th, 2023, he also bought a substance called Oil of Wintergreen and searched the toxicity of the essential oil when consumed. So investigators suspect that the earlier smoothie incident on August 10th may have been a poisoning attempt using the different substance. Oh, so like a different method. Mm-hmm. So all of those searches were done on a work laptop. Using a VPN, digital footprint, everything's documented. It kind of goes to show you like you can be super book smart and go through medical school and pharmacy school but a little bit of cybersecurity knowledge probably could have went a long way. Maybe he should have went to... Uh, should have been his minor. Yeah, he should have, because I don't know. I think he dropped the ball on this one. Yeah. Now, after a two-month investigation, Connor was arrested on October 20th, 2023, and charged with second-degree murder with intent not premeditated. How is it not premeditated that dude literally has Google searches for different chemicals that can kill someone? Yeah, it sounds pretty planned, but Minnesota requires a grand jury indictment for first-degree murder. The initial charge is always second degree. On July 5th, 2024, the grand jury did upgrade Connor Bowman's charges to one count of murder in the first degree, premeditated, and with intent, and an additional count of murder in the second degree, with intent. Good, I guess. He is currently being detained by Olmstead County, with bail set at $2 million. Woo! So far, no additional hearing or trial dates have been set. And because this has been a pretty high-profile case, the assigned judge has been pretty strict about sealing documents and releasing transcripts and warrants. Connor's attorney had to file a request to access the grand jury's transcripts, and the judge limited access to only those attorneys working directly on the case. Even the clerks or paralegals from the firm were declined access, with Judge Kathy Wallace saying, I think the potential for the information to get out is too great the further this is expanded. The public interest in this case is obviously a big concern if it comes to a trial. I really, really, really hope we charge Connor 
But I have to ask, so what about Crumpet the Corgi? Do we know what happened to him? So Crumpet is living in Wichita with Betty's mom. Oh. And Betty's sister and her husband, Matt, they got matching tattoos in honor of Betty. They're super cute. It's a cartoon image of Crumpet the Corgi holding a syringe to pay homage to her job in pharmacy. So Crumpet is safe and sound and loved. This will definitely be a case we will check in on. Yeah, maybe we'll get some updates and we'll do a side salad episode. Yeah. One thought that I had during this episode and like this case and everything is I wonder if they're going to start to make restrictions on ordering medicines for doctors and things like that. Because like we said earlier, this isn't the first time that a doctor or a dentist was just able to order this type of drug online without any restrictions, you know, like there's no one saying, yeah, go ahead. Okay. This is for a client or a patient, you know, like there's just no restrictions. It seems like. Yeah. I mean, there has to be something this keeps happening. What was the one we just read about? It was like a, some type of flower. Recently, there was a teacher who was accused of trying to poison her husband with Lily of the Valley in, go figure, a smoothie. A smoothie? Wasn't it like some type of plant? Like Lily of the Valley? Is that a some type of yeah, plant? Yeah, it's a poisonous plant. Just something you can order off the internet? It's just a plant. They, they sell them anywhere, at any store. That's nuts. So what I learned from this episode is I'm never taking a smoothie from you. If you ever bring me a smoothie, I am not drinking it. Honestly, you can still make me a smoothie. Okay. Protein packer with peanut butter, please. Ooh, that one is good. But if it tastes bitter, I swear to you, yeah, I will... Dump it out. Give it to me. <laughs> okay, fine. We always have to make a promise that we taste each other's smoothies before we give it to each other. Mm, it's kind of like in those movies when they uh, they do the old switcheroo on the drinks. Yeah. And that completes this week's episode. Just remember, get a divorce. Don't poison your spouse for life insurance money. How else are you going to get the money? It's not going to work out for you. I promise. No, it really never does. <laughs> and before we drop off here, please send us a nice review on Apple Podcasts. And if you'd like to be a Patreon subscriber or an Apple subscriber, you are welcome to join in on the ad-free listens. So check it out. And we will see you next week. See ya. See ya.